Good evening, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. So if you have gotten the cookies you want and grabbed some fruit and some water, we'll go ahead. And there's an echo. <laughs> I am Leslie Sibillic, Senior Curator here at the Senator John Hines History Center. And on behalf of everybody here, welcome this evening. We are always pleased to welcome Veterans Breakfast Club. We are thrilled when we host kind of co-host events with them here. And I know that some of you, in fact, may have even been to multiple events today as we mark the 70th, 70th anniversary of the armistice related to the Korean War. And then we're also looking tonight at some of the defenders of Korea, the larger story, but we're mainly marking the armistice too. And I know that you might have been to more than one event today, so we're really appreciative of you being here. Um, I'm just going to give a few opening remarks, and then I'll turn the program over to Todd, and I'll give you just a little bit of a sense of how the evening will unfold. We have multiple pieces for the program this evening. And, you know, I have to say, when we were planning this program here at the History Center, we've had some of the same conversations that I know you've had, and I know I sat in on this Monday's happy hour for the Veterans Breakfast. Breakfast Club, just talking about the background of the Korean War and the way it is perceived in American history and in American culture. It is, in many respects, an unfamiliar war to still too many Americans. In some cases, it's called the Forgotten War. Others, there's some scholars who would argue that it's the ignored war, lost between the immensity of World War II and kind of the controversy and the greater media coverage of Vietnam but then also kind of buried within a nervous government and a public that was ready to move on. I have to say, in just doing some reading for this, I saw a couple of the references that talk about how even in 1952, in a magazine like US News and World Report, they talked about it as the Forgotten War. 1952, it's still going on. I think it was going on right in the middle of it. And I think that really highlights the psychology of the time and I know you're going to hear a statement tonight. There are some people who would argue that there's another way to look at it, that it's not the forgotten war, but maybe the forgotten victory. Certainly anybody who's seen what has happened in South Korea over the years sees a very different version of how that played out between the two partitioned parts, the sides of Korea. And so we're also really looking at that this evening. Um, Looking at this, both the anniversary, marking 70 years, and also saying thank you to those who have been involved with the defense of Korea in the years past that. And I have to say, looking at it from the perspective of a day of ceremonies, the new conversations, and certainly the media right now, reminds us that if anybody thought this was over in three years, clearly it is not. Clearly it is not over now. 2023, there's so much to dig into and so much for us to be appreciative of and say thank you to you, the veterans. Now this evening, here's how it's going to work. I'm going to call Todd over to the podium and he is going to talk a little bit about the background of the war and give a little bit of the historical perspective on it. And then he will call our two esteemed guests up to the stage. You see two chairs up here. And that, and I wanna make sure I get your names right. That's Bob Parbula, the Marine Corps, US Marine Corps, and then Dwayne Myers, US Navy SEALs. And I'll let um, Todd give you a little bit more background on them. He's going to facilitate a conversation with them. Then you'll get a chance to hear and I know those of you who are part of the Veterans Breakfast Club, the virtual program on Monday night have already heard this, but you'll get a statement from Susan Key, who is a remarkable Korean War historian and veterans advocate. She's based out of Arizona, another remarkable story. And she's very eloquent in her kind of perspective and what she says about the value and the meaning of the Korean War and the defense of South Korea even after that. And we're going to look at that. You'll get a statement, and then will be the pinning ceremony. And so we'll call each of you up. Todd will give you a little bit more instruction on how that will go. If you had seen our Vietnam War event, you've already seen a piece of how that works. And then Todd will finish out and close out the program for this evening. So again, on behalf of the Heinz History Center, thank you for your service. Thank you for being here tonight. Some of you, I know this might be the third event you've attended today. We are glad and we are pleased to welcome you here. And I will turn the program over to Todd DePestino. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. And thank you, Ann Matters. 
Thank you to everybody at the Heinz History Center. It is always so great to partner with this amazing institution on an important day like this. Oh, thanks to all of you too for coming out and remembering the Forgotten War. Uh, it's wonderful to partner with the Heinz History Center on an important historic date. 70 years ago today, the Korean War ended. Yeah, true sign is from Stars and Stripes, July 27th, 1953. And I think the question of the evening is, uh, if the war ended, why did the fighting continue? I mean, look at this. July 31st, 1963, U.S. blasts Reds for DMZ murders. August 12th, 1967, North Koreans kill three GIs. January 12th, 1967, North yes, Koreans kill three GIs. 83 men, that would be the USS Pueblo. That happened right before January 12th, 1967. 1960. North Koreans will switch GIs. Really traumatic. That happened right before January 12th, 1967. North Koreans will switch GIs. Really traumatic. 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 Really traumatic.
that was one of the key factors that led into Stalin agreeing that Kim Il-sung, the time was now to invade. And during the war, of course, you see the numbers go up. Uh, 950, in 1953, there were 326,000 U.S. troops in Korea fighting in the Korean War. And uh, so there were three over 300,000 troops. Uh, Ronald Reich was one of them right here in the second row. He'll be coming up today. He was there on July 27th, 1953, when the word came down that the, the war was over. The fighting was going to stop. And I just asked him, was there a celebration? And he said, oh, yeah, yes, there was. That he remembered being on a hill and looking down on the front lines right below him. And he said, all oh, these guns started going off. And then somehow fireworks started going, what looked like fireworks going off uh, from the, the hooches and the, the foxholes that were down below him. So it was a, a great celebration and a great relief to those 300,000. But you can see in 1954, there's still 200, over 200,000. And the numbers remain very high year after year until, you know, 2020, there's still today, there are 28,000 U.S. service members. Uh, Korea, which began as uh, strategically not considered important to the U.S. or to the Soviet Union, suddenly has become, suddenly became, because of the war, a very critical place uh, in, in geopolitical considerations. Uh, so much so that the largest overseas over U.S. overseas military installation is Camp Humphreys near Seoul. This is a, a picture of it. Um, it's the, the you know the largest military uh, installation that the U.S. has overseas, um, and it all began with a map. It all began with a map in 1945. Many of you know this history. Uh, the Korean Peninsula suffered horribly under 35 years of Japanese imperial occupation. Uh, really, some of the worst, most brutal colonial occupation in history happened on the Korean Peninsula. And so World War II was a liberation from Imperial Japan. And at the end of the war, this was now an opportunity for Korea to become an independent country. And the U.S. had assumed that uh, Korea would be able to become an independent country pretty quickly. But the Soviet Union was in, was called in to declare war against the Japanese uh, just a few days after the war, after the before the Japanese surrendered. And the Soviet Union took advantage of that and with the Japanese surrender, sent troops into the northern part of the Korean Peninsula. The U.S. was concerned because the U.S. didn't have a large troop presence in Korea. They were concerned that the, the Russians might want to take the entire peninsula. And so two army colonels were assigned to draw, come up with a boundary that to get the Soviets to promise not to cross. And these two army colonels spent 30 minutes with a National Geographic map. And they looked at it and they thought, well, that looks fair. It just so happens that the 38th parallel runs right through about the center of Korea, just like one of those accidents of geography. Uh, and they thought this is a good dividing place. They asked Truman, relayed a message to Truman to approve it. He did right away, giving it very little thought. And this border was drawn. I had a professor once who said something like, if you look, ever see on a map, a straight border, you could almost guarantee the person who drew that line was never in that country. <laughs> because people aren't split on straight borders. They're split by mountains and rivers and geographic factors that, that you, you have to be on the ground to appreciate. So this cut through villages. It cut through, you know, mountain ranges. And it kind of artificially divided north and south. A client state developed in the north under Soviet uh, rule and a parallel client state uh, developed uh, under much less guidance by the United States in the South. And uh, it was on June 25th, 1950, that North Korea poured its North Korean army over the 38th parallel and invaded South Korea, taking over almost the entire peninsula. The Korean War was a war of miscalculation 
and surprise. Every month, it seemed a miscalculation and a surprise. Uh, the miscalculation that, that the North Koreans made, they had promised and guaranteed um, Stalin that the United States would not enter the war. And that's the only reason Stalin agreed to allow Kim Il-sung to take over the peninsula because he was convinced that the US would not enter the war. But of course, the Truman administration responded immediately and all his advisors immediately chimed in and said, we have to go in and defend South Korea, which is really remarkable when you consider in 1950, hardly any Americans knew where Korea was. They didn't understand the country. They didn't know anything about it, but they did know that President Truman had made this commitment on March 12, 1947, in a remarkable speech to Congress, he said, we will oppose communist expansion anywhere in the world. That is quite a big promise. And this was a big test as to whether that he was going to stand behind that promise. So he was able to uh, get this uh, a defense of South Korea, able to get the United Nations behind it. And with UN with 14 nations sending troops in support of South Korea, 14 nations sending troops. I think Ethiopia sent troops. Uh, the United States had the most uh, in fighting on the South Korean side. Uh, the, those UN forces were able to fight back the North Korean army, all push them all the way back. You can see this wonderful animated map that when the war starts, the North Korean people's army is just so powerful it sweeps through to the bottom of the peninsula and takes all over almost the entire peninsula, except for a little perimeter in the bottom right, you'll see, that's called the Pusan perimeter right there. And that was what was the U.S. started with to fight back this North Korean army. And uh, General MacArthur, his master stroke, of course, was to land 80,000 Marines at Incheon on September 15th. 1950 to cut the North Korean supply lines worked beautifully, perfectly, forcing uh, the North Korean army to retreat from Pusan back up to North Korea. And then the fateful decision was made to then, I think it was September 30th, to cross for UN forces to cross north into North Korea and take the fight to the north. This was controversial. It was an iffy call, but they made the call. And they made the call with the assumption that, with the assurance that China would not again get into the war. In other words, it was a certainty that the US was going to be able to push the North Korean army you know, up to the Yalu River, and that the Allied forces would be able to take the entire peninsula, liberate the entire peninsula. And they started to do it. And until the next month, when the great surprise happened, uh, China, the People's Republic of China, which had just had a communist revolution in 1949, sent 300,000 Chinese troops across the border into contact. Most of them even had weapons and into fighting uh, people like Bob Arbula, who was in uh, North Korea, or yeah, North Korea at the time. And this changed the calculus of the war. And it pushed the Allied forces back down over the 38th parallel until a bigger commitment could be made. We had to pour more troops into Korea to even the score, even the sides. And then in April, 1951, so this is not even a full year. All this back and forth, the seesaw war happens in a matter of months. It's April 1951 when there's a stalemate emerges at the 38th parallel. And this is where the two sides stand off. They dig in, they create defensive positions that deter the other side from offensive operations. And you have a classic stalemate. And that's when about when the peace talks begin and the peace talks take two years. And while the two years of talking is being done, Americans are dying, uh, North Koreans are dying, South Koreans are dying, and Chinese are dying in this war right along the 38th parallel. In the end, this is a, an extremely brutal 
war with very high casualties. Considering how small the country is, how limited really the heavy fighting was, it's remarkable how many casualties there were. I mean, we're talking 5 million people killed in the entire war. Uh, about 36,000 of them are American service members and uh, over 100,000 American service members wounded. And so that's what we're commemorating uh, tonight, this war, this forgotten war that Americans really, even at the time, Leslie, I thought that was so interesting. Uh, even at the time during the war, uh, Americans weren't paying much, they were paying attention right up to early 1951. And then it's like, you know, when you're watching a football game and your team is winning and then they start losing and you realize they're gonna lose, you turn off the TV. It's like Americans turned off the TV. They stopped following it. And we've had Korean War veterans come to our Veterans Breakfast Club and say that they remember coming home from Korea, combat Korea in 1952, 1953. And people would say, where have you been? And it'd say, Korea. And an answer was, that's still going on. People weren't following it. It's so fascinating that it was even a forgotten war at the time. Um, so we want to kind of remember the forgotten war and, uh, and especially remember those who served in the hottest part, 1950 to 1953, but also all the defenders who have served since because it has remained hot ever since. Some 3 million Americans have served in Korea, 3 million since 1953. And we have a lot of them in the room tonight. And we wanna honor them and have them have a little bit of their story shared. Uh, but we'd also like to focus on uh, those who fought during the hottest of the hot years. And I'm gonna call up uh, Marine Bob Arcula. Leslie, you called Bob, you called Bob and Dwayne distinguished guests. And Bob, you had a look on your face like that's the first time I've ever been called that. Thank you, Bob Harbula. Uh, Bob is the cover story of our BBC magazine. Uh, if you don't get BBC magazine, we send it out to about uh, 8,500 households. You can have a seat, Bob, if you'd like. Um, we send it out to about 8,500 households and then print up another 7,500 to hand distribute. It's the marketing that we do, and it's also the programming that we do. We try to get the stories out in written form that we hear at our events. Feel free as you leave today to take a magazine if you don't get it at home. If you don't get it at home, it's because we don't have your address. Feel free to leave your address, but also feel free to take the magazine uh, if, if you haven't gotten it. And take a stack of 25 if you have people you want to deliver it to who you think would enjoy the stories. This is a particularly memorable cover story. Bob Armula uh, landed on Inchon with that, those 80,000 Marines, changed the course of the war on, um, on September 15, 1950, fought in the Battle of Seoul, and then fought in the legendary battle of the Chosen Reservoir. And he's gonna talk a little bit about it tonight. And then we have Dwayne Myers. Dwayne, would you mind coming up, please? Dwayne, I met Dwayne. I'm gonna hear some of his story for the first time, at least what he's able to talk, tell about it. See what we could get out of him. I met Dwayne here in April at uh, Mosquito Bowl talk and I immediately gravitated to him because I there was a there was something about him that caught my eye. And it was that hat, the USS Tusk, the submarine. And then he had a purple heart on the hat. And I thought, how in the world does somebody in a submarine get a purple heart? And I started asking him about it. And he said, hmm, that's a story. Interesting. <laughs> and it's a great story. And I want him to share what he could share about it tonight. But I do want to let you know that before Dwayne starts sharing his story, I think this is an emblematic of the war also. You know, everything in, with World War II, just about everything has been declassified. His, as a historian, I like that because that means that, uh, you know, all the records are available to us. That's not the case with the Korean War. There are still 70 plus years later, classified elements of the Korean War that can't be disclosed because the enemy is still there and we're still at war. And so uh, Dwayne very much respects that classification. And so there are parts of his story that he will not share. But, uh, but we'll, we'll see what we could 
see what we could get out of them. Um, and I do want to thank also people who are watching this remotely at home. I know there are quite a few viewers around the country and in Pittsburgh who are watching this program. And I, and I know a lot of it has to do with they want to hear Bob and Dwayne talk. So let me, Bob, can I start with you? Um, I'm going to show a picture. That's a great picture of you, Bob. Uh, when was that taken and why is your hair so? I don't know why he isn't in Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> Why isn't he in Hollywood? That's a good. You could play like Audie Murphy into Helen back. Exactly. Was that taken when you were in Eighth and I? Okay. Could you tell people what Eighth and I was? Eighth and I is in D.C., about two blocks from the Capitol, and it's a square block, and in, in the center of it is a parade ground, and this is where the Commandant of the Marine Corps lives. And we're there to guard the president on special details, like when he goes to Camp David or Shangri-La, that it was called then. Uh, we go up and check out the bridges, and we guard the perimeter up at the top of Vermont Mountain, where Camp David is. And uh, we have other duties besides that. Uh, any special uh, detail, like uh, burials at Arlington, we bury most of the Second World War uh, casualties that ones that were killed. We'd have burials for them out at uh, Arlington Cemetery. And uh, the other thing was, one of the other uh, details we had was John Wayne made the movie Stanza Iwo Jima. And we were picked to go down and be ushers and guide the congressmen and their families to seats and this is when I changed. When I was down at the, at the Warner Theater in DC, watching John Wayne six times in three days. And I on the way back, I told my buddy, I says, I need a war. And just two, three months later, the Korean War starts. And they put up a, a bullet and they wanted 10 men from Eighth and I to go to California and form a Raider Battalion. And if you did that, you got 10 days special leave to take your stuff home and fly out to San Diego. And uh, when we got there, well, in that 10 day period, things really got bad in Korea. They were pushed down to the Pusan perimeter. Uh, MacArthur wanted the division now. And Todd, I hate to tell you this, but we only had 20,000. 20,000? That's all we had in Korea ever. One division. and um, But we didn't have a division. We were guarding all the embassies. We went from 700,000 men in World War II down to 70,000. And we guarded all the uh, seaports, all the uh, uh, embassies. And uh, we, we had like two, two regiments with two battalions and usually a regiment has three, but three battalions and uh, three regiments. So we, we were in bad shape at that time. But anyhow, we went out there. And, well, when I got to Camp Pendleton, I said, there's a lot of familiar faces out here. I was talking to the other guy who lived in Pittsburgh and they were from 8th and I. And then we find out that they took everybody out of Eighth and I. They were down to bare minimums at all the posts in, in the United States to make that division for, for uh, MacArthur landing um, at Inchon. And we learned oh, what we did out there. We didn't practice any warfare. We went up and got the weapons, the machine guns and that out of um, uh, the, the depot, they were all covered with cosmoline. And all we had doing up there was picking them up and cleaning them off. And cosmoline is a very ugly material. It's hard to get off, but you got to get it all off the machine gun or it, it'll heat up. And uh, the other times when we had there, we'd be in full packs walking up and down the mountains of Camp Pendleton. And I said, when are we going to get some fighting? 
you know, when we're going to learn how to fight. But well, we never did learn any fighting there. They put us on the ship, took 13 days to get to Japan. We went to Camp Atsu, which was a uh, Japanese Marine camp during the war. And again, we were walking up and down the mountains there, full packs and no, no practice. And that turned out to be the best thing that could happen because the worst thing for a service man to go into battle is to not be in shape. You're no good if you can't keep up. And when those bullets start flying, you want to be your men, you want to be able to keep up. If they drop out, you, that's the same as being killed because they're no help to you on the front lines. So this we found out later why we did all that marching and carrying this stuff up and down the hills. But on the ship, we learned how to uh, uh, fire the machine gun and we got learned how to take it apart. Uh, that put us in a black, dark room and the machine gun would be all laying all over the floor and you had to go and put it together. And then sometimes the sergeant would pull out some, some of the mechanisms to test you and you can't seem to get it together. But we learned, that's how you teach them. And now when we went to Korea, the Marine Corps is an amphibious organization. Uh, amphibious means water. We attack from the beaches. We land on the beaches like in the Second World War. We hit all those islands, but we never hit an island and we never hit a sandy beach in Korea. And this was going to be a land war. Now we're not equipped for land war. The army gets 11,000 trucks for division and the Marine Corps gets 6,000. So there's a big difference. Anytime we wanted to go somewhere to make another attack, we had a bay bar and steel, or we could only move a certain number of people instead of moving a whole battalion, we might only be able to move two companies. So we're always behind the eight ball. But in Korea, you do mostly walk and, and that country is so mountainous. Every hill you take or climb, you see, man, there can't be anything higher than this. Well, when you get to the top, there's one higher right next to it. And this is how, what you had a fight through in Korea. Bob, I'm going to interrupt you just for a second because I, I'm looking at this picture up here on the right. It's an iconic picture of the landing at Incheon. And I'd, I'd seen it before when I met Bob. And uh, we had a program where I showed the picture and Bob said, I made those ladders. I said, what do you mean you made those ladders? And you said on the ship, on the way to Incheon, you're hammering two by fours together for ladders to get on the seawall. And none of them broke. <laughs> That was a really important lesson for a non-veteran like me to to understand, uh, you know, overcome, adapt and overcome. Uh, that serving the military requires a lot of different skills, and you have to just make do with what you have. They knew there was going to be a seawall. They didn't have ladders, so you Marines were making them. This is where you saw your first combat action. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're going up the sea la the ladders. And the, uh, one of the firemen, uh, Corporal Barnes, who was the first one up top, and he's up here cutting the ball wire on the fence, and a bullet ricochets and hits him in the neck. And I was the next one on the ladder, and I'm watching him as he turns colors and dies. And it wasn't like the John Wayne movie that I saw. It just put a different feeling into you. Well, when we're going down at Inchon on the Amtraks, uh, one of my buddies said, uh, the guy, he lived in uh, Chester, West Virginia. He was another machine gunner. He said, this is just like being in the movies. 
and we're in it. And you see the planes coming over your head, shooting, strafing ahead of you, all the cannons going off, and war is so noisy. I'm just going to fix your. Okay. There, there we go. There we go. All right. Everybody hear me all right? Yep. Good. So, as I was saying before, the, the difference in Korea for the Marines was this was a land war. So we had to pretend we were soldiers like the, the army, but they have all the equipment and all the food and right. they're eating steaks and we're eating sea rations. <laughs> they took good care of us over there. But in World War II, the first Marine division that we were in got three pucks in the whole war. How many of you don't know what a puck is? They don't know what a puck is. Hockey puck, they're thinking, Bob. Okay. Puck is the presidential unit citation. And you'll remember these battles that I mentioned. The, the three that they got was for Guadalcanal, Peleliu, and Okinawa in the entire war. In Korea, we got three pucks in seven months. Now, what, a, what do you get that for? Hey, Bob, I'm showing the ribbons up there. Do you want to, time to talk about that? All right, the middle one is the puck. This is the presidential unit citation in the middle. Oh, no, it, like that going up? No, yeah, the middle one is the puck, presidential unit citation. And on it, it has two stars. That means that counts for three. Right, the ribbon and then two stars for the other two. The other one is combat action ribbon and the other one is a, a north i mean a south korean presidential unit citation you don't get medals for these but the puck i'll read you what it says in their official uh, nomination here the unit must display such gallantry determination esprit de corps in accomplishing its mission under extremely difficult and hazardous conditions so as to set it apart from and above other units participating in the same campaign. The collective degree of valor, uh, which is combat heroism, against an arm enemy by the unit nominator for the PUC is the same as that which would warrant the award of an ind individual award of the Navy Cross, which is the second highest medal you can receive. So that's what a puck is. Now, these three battles in seven months, you won't see too many of these on, on the, the servicemen. And this is what, when I look at servicemen and I see what they're, you know, they all have big racks of ribbons. Not too many have presidential unit citations. And this was the difference in Korea. We were in an entirely different war, but we were good. And we were good because of our officers our commanding officer was uh, General O.P. Smith, who has to be one of the greatest generals this country ever had. What he did at the Chosen Reservoir is unbelievable. I couldn't believe we did what we did. When we went to, got out to Chosen, which is in North Korea. I will, here, let's get to that. Let's get to a map. Here it is. Here's the Chosen Reservoir. When, this is up in North Korea in the middle of the mountains. And we were sent there to get up to the Yalu River. And whoever sent us there must hate us. Because they didn't want us to come back, I don't think. There was 12,000 of us, and we're the war fighters in the division. There's other people that were in the division that's down at Hung Nam, down by the seaport, and the amphibious part, and supply people. But there was 12,000 of us up there. We got surrounded by 150,000 Chinese. Even if they had bows and arrows, you shouldn't win that battle. But we put the Ninth Army Group, Chinese Ninth Army Group, out of action. A, a general, one of their generals, said after the battle that they came into the Chosen. To annihilate the Marine Corps, the 12,000 Marines that were there. They came up to 150,000 men. 
And after the battle, they had 35,000 effectives. That means they lost 115,000 men in that one battle. It lasted, the battle lasted two weeks. And we kicked their ass. Now, I'm, I'm just gonna, when you talk to Bob about his service in the Marine Corps, he almost never uses the word I. That is a Marine, that's a Marine trait right there. The presidential unit citations that he's proud of, that's for the unit. That's not for what he did. He always puts it as we. I'm sorry, Bob. Getting back. Now, there, the 9th Army Group was put out of action um, with 115,000 casualties when we left North Korea. And that's another story how we got out. But um, I was talking about the officers we had. Uh, Colonel Puller, Chesty Puller. I don't know if it, how many of you know who he is, but he's the icon in the Marine Corps. Everybody, well, when the boots go to bed at night at Paris Island or uh, out on the West Coast at, at uh, the boot camp, they all say, Good night, Chesty, wherever you are. That's part of their requirement to be a boot. And then we had General, well, Colonel Murray, Ray Murray. He was the commander of the 5th Marines. And Blitzen Litzenberg was commander of the 7th Marines. And these were three of the finest officers out of World War II. And they didn't waste lives. We got, we came out of there. We lost a lot of men because we were always in action. When you're in action, you're going to lose men. And we had 200 killed out of the, out of the 200 man George company. 200 of them died in Korea. Think about that. Out of 200 company is 200 people. 200 people in that company were killed. So they had to constantly be replaced. We had over a thousand Purple Hearts in George Company. And that's why they call us Bloody George. And if you got the, ever got to see the um, Bloody George at the Chosen Reservoir on the American Heroes Channel, it talks about George Company at the Reservoir, what we did, how we saved the First Marine Division. And, and um, our company commander got the Medal of Honor but we got the pops, so it was just as good. Bob, the story of, and I do want to get to Dwayne soon, but the story of the Chosen Reservoir, what people think of when they think of the Frozen Chosen is the weather. It's 30 degrees below zero. You are fighting to not freeze to death as much as you are fighting the enemy. Uh, I was stunned. I think one of the most stunning parts of your story that's in the magazine is when you go to East Hill, and you bring, you have a 30 light machine gun and it freezes on you. You can't fire it. Any snow gets on it. And if the machine gun's hot, it's going to melt. And it works its way down into the chamber and freezes up. And so the machine gun won't fire. And uh, that's the most horrible thing that can happen to a combat person is for their weapon not to fire. Because now you're reduced to, you're going to get overrun, which they did, they overran us. And I saw guys take their helmets off, which I did, and hit other the Chinese on the head with it. They didn't have helmets, so they had headaches. <laughs> and um, other guys they took their entrenching tools and I, Tighten it here, it was like a pick. And that's how we dug into the snow. But hit, they used that as a weapon because when you get that many Chinese coming at you, you don't have time to reload your rifle or weapon. It's tough. And when they're on top of you, you fight for your life. And that's the only way, that's the only way you're going to be victorious. And they were sure glad to see us get out of Korea. Chinese. Dwayne, I'd like to turn to you and you see these pictures of Frozen Chosen right here. 
uh, Bob will sing the praises of tanks in combat as long as you want him to sing because uh, he, he attributes his survival to the appearance of 29 tanks uh, at Hagaru that helped them get through. Um, Dwayne, this is you as a young sailor. What made you want to join the Navy? Did you hear Dwayne? Uh, he asked you a question. What made you want to join the Navy, Dwayne? What did I want to do? What made you want to join the Navy? I wanted to get a college education. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's why you joined? Did, did you like the Navy? Pardon? Did you like the Navy? Parts of it. <laughs> food. Good food. Good food. Good food. What was your first job in the Navy? I was uh, on the Midway first. After I came out of uh, high school, I joined up. I went to sub school. Then I went to uh, UDT, underwater demolition. Right. Why did you go to sub school, submarine school? 80% more pay. There you go. Honest man, 80% more pay. Um, did you like submarines? Loved it. Did you really? You loved it? Didn't get claustrophobic or anything like that? We only had 66 men and six officers. Then you went to UDT. That was underwater demolition training. And uh, you, we know it today as the Navy SEALs. The, Navy, the forerunner of the Navy SEALs were these underwater demolition teams that began in 1942 and fought mostly in the Pacific. Uh, it was still very much a, a very young sub-branch of the Navy that did training in Florida, Fort Pierce, and in Coronado, California. Uh, it, they were renowned. Wayne, you might correct me on this. But anybody who wanted to join the UDT, and they were called frogmen, had to be very fit and a little bit crazy, I think. Right? I mean, <laughs> you're, you're, it's, so, it's so, even the training is dangerous. What was the training like? At Coronado? Well, we was only 18 years old and we figured we could make the world ourselves. And we tried to do it. <laughs> and then you joined the Navy in 1948, and then the Korean War broke out in 1950. When did you enter the war? Uh, April of 50, just by the time it started. They sent me back to Coronado update on all the new explosives and equipment. And then we went to Russia. I didn't tell you that before. No, you didn't. A lot of our missions are in that book that Jim has here, Blind Man's Bluff. That's a wonder, it's a wonderful book. I highly recommend it. I know several people in the room have read it. Blind Man's Bluff, it's really about the underwater uh, subterfuge uh, of the Cold War, right? Uh, 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 submarine warfare um, in the Cold War, and you're in that. You're in that book. We'd swim into shore up in Russia, particularly around Murmansk Bay, Russia, where they kept their subs. And sometimes we jumped out of a uh, uh, glider, usually five to seven of us on a mission, and we jump over either the jungle, the ice, or the water. And uh, we were supposed to sneak in, sneak out, and nobody knew we was around. And we weren't armed like the Marines. Uh, we had, everybody carried at least four diving knives. Four what? Diving knives. Oh, diving knives. Actually, they were the M3s. Okay. M ones, and they were razor sharp. Whenever we had nothing to do, we sharpened them up. So you always kept them sharp. And uh, then uh, we uh, we lost Kachino up in the North Sea as our sister ship. So your ship, your submarine, was the USS Tusk, and. Uh, 
we lost seven earned men trying to save their crew. And that was the USS Kachino, and that was another submarine, a sister ship? Kachino. They went down 900 and some feet. But we got everybody off except seven that we lost, and they lost one. And after that, then they uh, gave us some R and R. Then we went to uh, Seoul, and then uh, North Korea. Almost all of our missions was in North Korea. Your missions were in North Korea. Is this photo here of the of your UDT team? Yeah, that's that's me right over here. That's you up there, DVM, Main V Myers. Right. There's 100 that started the training and 30, 31 finished. Wow. Well, and you were one of the 31. Yeah. But you could quit anytime you wanted to, and it never went on your record. All you had to do is take the baseball bat and hit a gong, take them over, pick you up, take you ashore. And that was it. Wow. How interesting. Here's a picture of some. Frogman, I don't know if this is training or or actual operation. Yep. Uh, is this kind of like what the what you would wear on some of these missions? That's part of our group. I'm not on there. That's part of your group. I think so. This is a this is definitely a picture of Korean War. Frogman. That's why I'm not on there. Yeah. <laughs> How do you do but that? I do have a picture very similar to that. And here is your picture. This picture is in the book, Blind Man's Block. There I am. You're in this picture. Where are you? Which one? Right here. Second guy. Oh, the second guy, this? No, oh, wait a minute. I think it's this first one here. That's Dick. I'm, I'm right here. First one. The first one. This guy was named Red, and we were blowing something up, and we only had so many minutes to get out of there. And when he hit that plunger, he shoved that raft off. Look at that plunger right there. I, I didn't see it before, but yeah, he has his hand on a plunger there about to blow something up. This is North Korea? On shore. On shore. Big artillery gun. Used to be there. You blew it up. <laughs> Wayne, were you ever scared? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Never thought about it. But I mean, like, yeah. him, he was young. And uh, when we were told to do something, we did it. There's one mission that you went on. I think you were the Tusk dropped you off coast of North Korea at night, October 51, 1951. It was a dark, a dark we headed ashore. And what was your mission? What were you to do? Can't tell you. <laughs> Can you give us a hint? <laughs> but it was up, we were up around Pam and John. You were up around Pam and John, okay, where the Negotiations were taking place. This would be October 1951. Now there's a big bay there. The sub went in, and then we took off, swam about a mile to get ashore. We stayed in there for five days, living five off days. the land, land. Living off the land. Yeah. What did you eat? You want to hear? Yeah. <laughs> Snakes? Uh, fish and worms? If you take a seashell or your knife, you cut a nice fish and worm in half, take your fingernails, push that black stuff out, they're good. Better if they're cooked. <laughs> Better if they're cooked. <laughs> the one thing that is as good is a seagull. A seagull. Yeah. Kind of gamey. Bitter. Bitter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Okay, my stomach's turning a little, but um, so so you live off the land. You're you're there for five days, October 1951. You can't quite tell us what the mission was, but it was on the DMZ in the 38th parallel Pemumshan area, and you get detected, right? Hey, what you the, the, you encounter some North Korean, yeah, North Koreans, and what happens? Well, we finished that mission, went on about four or five more till uh, we had one that was around one song, one, one sang or yeah, one song. Oh, oh yeah. And uh, we met the army. The army was coming up, and we went in this way, and we both went <laughs> that way. And the North Korean guerrillas met us over here. And uh, we left, well, we had to leave with them. Then we come back, and uh, that was all around first week of October. And when I got my Purple Heart here, it's the only time that it was ever mentioned. So I can say what the uh, accommodation was that I was leading my men back to the, the boat, which is a sub. A ship is on the surface, sub is a boat. Leading my men back to the boat on the 6th, 7th, and 8th of October 1951 was ambushed by 16 North Koreans as we were digging our equipment up to swim out to the sub. And what happened? Yeah. We had 145 that jammed up after the third shot. That's the only one we had. We had our diving knives. And uh, there's only two of us left standing whenever we finished up. There's bayoneted there, bayoneted here, shot here, shot here, shot here, shot here, right here in the lake. Never felt it. And uh, the other guy had the 45, helped bandage me up. We got the bleeding stopped on me and the other uh, three guys. I took two of them, he took one. We started swimming out toward where he's going to pick up the sub. And the captain seen some flashes going on. So he knew he was in trouble. So he sent two life rafts in with armed guards, armed sailors. And uh, we didn't have any Marines, by the way. You needed us. Nobody to dance with. <laughs> and uh, they met us and took over, and then <clears throat> the uh, yeoman, yeoman, the bosun's mate, bosun's mate. Oh, the guy, Corman. Corman. The Corman passed us up and sewed us up a little better. And next day we went about twenty mile out to sea, and then got picked up by a helicopter and taken to the hospital ship. And uh, that was. The end of the story, I never told my mother, never told my dad, never told my wife or my kids until two years ago. And I didn't tell them everything yet. But we were, before we were discharged, for 10 days, 10 hours, five days a week before we discharged, we were brainwashed and swore never to talk about it, stuff we did. And I know why, but can't tell you why. What a what an honor it is to just hear a little bit of your story. Well, it's remarkable. I, it's remarkable, but I don't know how you go through life with a wife, with parents, with children, and not tell them anything. My wife says, you're all scarred up. Where do you get those scars? I said, I was raised on a farm. You know what the barbed bar wire does to you. Bob, when you came home from war, did you talk to people about it? There was nobody there. Left. All my buddies. 
all my buddies were in college or married. And I had to find new friends when I uh, they were all gone. And if I ran into somebody accidentally, they didn't even know where Korea was. So I never talked, I didn't, I quit talking about it, especially after I couldn't go to college in Pittsburgh and I couldn't get a job at the Westinghouse Atomic Plant as a guard because I was too young. You had to be 25 to be a guard there. And I was 21 when I got it. You were a grizzled veteran at 21 and you couldn't get a job at a plant as a guard. Especially a government plant. Well, would I have a case now? <laughs> I, want to th I want to thank both Bob and Dwayne for sharing a little of their stories here. Let's give them a round of applause. When I get this book of art, I was a commander of an armed groups veteran association, which has approximately 40 people in uniforms. We do sometimes two military funerals a week, right? even down to Arlington right, or uh, Allegheny National Cemetery, and Jim's our drummer. And... Uh, I was commander of this, and I, I've been trying to get out of it for about five years, trying to get somebody to take it over. And he told me, uh, we're having a meeting. I'd like for you to put your uniform on. He said, we got the new officers. They're going to put their new uniform on, and I want a picture. On. Okay. So I put it on. Almost everybody showed up, including him. <laughs> And uh, uh, all of a sudden, the guy walks in with a cake about that long, that wide, that thick. And I didn't know what it was. It was a, a cardboard box. And I thought, you know what? They're going to pull something on me. This is my first meeting after I retired. They've got a cake for me. And uh, then pretty soon, our state representative came in. He's carrying a little blue envelope. And well, you guys know what those are. You get them for almost anything you do in the military. Everybody has a half a dozen head under his arm. So, falling right down my line, I'm going to get a citation from the state. Okay. And uh, so the president conducted the meeting and he said, uh, uh, the state representative, do you have anything to say? He says, I do. He said, we're doing this in the state. We're doing that. We'd like to do this. Oh, by the way, Dwayne Mars, will you come up here? I had it all figured out. I went up and he says, uh, you get a hold of this envelope here. And it's about eight, two pieces of eight by 11. I had one side and he had the other. He says, hold it so the, the guys can see it. I did. And I seen these guys looking like that instead of just something like they had. And I thought, hmm. And I looked down. It was Purple Heart. And uh, I did, my family had slipped in. And my daughter was taking pictures behind everybody that I never saw any of the family because the representative had turned me to the with my back toward them, and the first two pictures I had my daughter erase them. <laughs> my eyes were ready to pop out because you were, yeah, and the uh, so emotional. The uh, cake had a big purple heart, almost a foot round, beautiful. If I see in uh, November, I'll bring a picture of it. Wayne did not receive a purple heart for the wounds that he received because of the classified mission. So it took a while. He only gave you one. Huh? He only gave you one first one. <laughs> you had enough to get 10.
It was younger than I am. Maybe he stepped down. Yeah. You need him? I'll help I'm you. I'm going down that way. You're going down that? Yeah. Why would he? <laughs> He's showing off. Step off down there. You know, I, I thought it would be appropriate uh, to share um, comments from Korean Americans and, and from people from Korea, because it's from Susan Key, who's pictured here, that I, I think I got a new perspective on the Korean War. She She's a historian. As Leslie said, she lives in Arizona. She's a veterans advocate for sure. And more than that, she has kind of made it her mission, I'd say for the past 10 years, really devoted her life to honoring Americans who have served in Korea. She's from Korea originally. And she, after moving here and living here for a while, I think it dawned on her that Americans have a misconception of the Korean War. She said, like, you people think you lost it. You lost the war. Or that it was somehow an unsuccessful war. She said, from our perspective, you saved us. It was, it was a great victory for us. I mean, we would not enjoy the freedoms and the prosperity, you know, that we do now and the future that we have uh, without the sacrifices of so many Americans who traveled halfway around the world to a place they'd never heard of you know, to save us. And she said, we, I, I want to kind of devote myself to, to kind of changing Americans' minds about that. So I asked her if she would send us, because she's in Arizona and very busy today, I asked her if she would send us a video that would express some of her sentiments. And I thought I'd play it for us now. It takes about five minutes. Her sentiments. And I thought I'd play it for us now. It takes about five minutes. Hi, my name is Susan Key. I'm a Korean War historian and writer. It takes about five minutes. And advocate of Korean War veterans and families of my heroes. Hi, my name is Susan Key. I'd like to first thank Todd Jovestino of the Veterans Breakfast Club. And advocate of Korean War veterans and families of my heroes. Hi, my name is Susan Key. I'd like to first thank Todd Jovestino of the Veterans Breakfast Club. And advocate of Korean War veterans and families of my heroes. Hi, my name is Susan Key. I'd like to first thank Todd Jovestino of the Veterans Breakfast Club. And advocate of Korean War veterans and families of my heroes. teenagers during the Korean War. My mom was living in Seoul, South Korea, uh, and she was about 11 years old when the Korean War teenagers started. during the Korean uh, War. My dad, my mom, was, was living in old, Seoul, South Korea, and his family had uh, just fled and she was from about 11 years old when, when the Korean, Korean War started. Teenagers during the Korean War. Uh, my dad, fled, my mom, was living in Seoul, South, South Korea, and his family had just fled and she was about 11 years old when the Korean War started. His dad, my mom, was living in Seoul, South Korea.
And I also hope that our Creamore veterans and families followed take great joy and pride in knowing that South Korea thrives as a free country today because of the victory uh, of the Korean War. Uh, many people may not think of the Korean War as a victory, but I consider it to be a victory because South Korea was saved. It was saved from communist tyranny. Millions of South Koreans live in freedom and in prosperity in total contrast to North Korea, where people are oppressed, where they have no freedoms to speak of and no opportunity and no hope and no future because of a, a communist tyrant that still rules their lives and has taken every freedom they've ever had. So in contrast to that, South Korean people are blessed. Uh, we are blessed, we are so grateful, and we're so thankful for the freedoms we have been given because of your sacrifice. So on behalf of the Korean people, I just want to express my heartfelt gratitude to our Korean War veterans and to families of fallen, and also to our Korean defense veterans. Uh, there have been over 3 million American service men and women who have defended Korea since the armistice agreement to the present day. And so South Korea continues to be defended by Americans uh, joined together with South Korean forces. And the alliance between South Korea and uh, the United States of America continues to be one of the strongest alliances in the world. So I thank God and I thank America. And I thank all of you, our Korean War veterans and families of fallen heroes. I will always be grateful to you and I will always honor and um, do everything I can to preserve your legacy. May God bless you and may God bless the United States of America. Kansamida. We thought we would do a recognition ceremony for those who uh, served in Korea from 1950 to the present. And we have about 40 names we'd like to read out. Each one of those uh, 40, if you're in the room with us tonight, we'd love you to step up, receive a pin, receive a certificate. We have uh, two wonderful veterans who are gonna be handing out the pins and certificate. Lieutenant Colonel Ben Wright, he is uh, 21 years in the Air Force, Vietnam veteran, uh, flew C-130s. He's actually also an honoree tonight, so I guess he'll give himself a <laughs> certificate and pen. Uh, he flew in and out of South Korea. And we have Larry Woods, who was in, um, uh, he was in a, a Vietnam veteran in Tui Hoa. Uh, he was in uh, security forces, security police um, uh, in, during the Vietnam War. Thank you both for handling the, the pinning tonight. So I thought I would read the names of our honorees. They will get this special pin that we had cast to try and capture that this is not just for those who served between 1950 and 1953, but those who have served since, in the 70 years since the armistice, 70 years ago today. And I'm gonna start in alphabetical order. And I'm gonna begin with a uh, submarine veteran Mike Allen, who served off South Korea. Uh, in 1968, 1972, he said he didn't see any land, <laughs> but uh, he knows he was there. Thank you, Mike. And you know, Mike has the distinction also of having served in the army as well as the Navy. Which do you like better, Mike? Uh, we also have Sheila Berg, she's watching online. She's from Allentown and she's really a remarkable veteran, 30 years in the Air Force. Uh, she served, um, uh, did many years in Korea very active with the uh, Jewish war veterans, uh, a national officer there. Sheila Berg would like to honor you. We will put your pin and your certificate in the, in the mail. Uh, Nars Kaliba is national officer for the Korean War Veterans Association. He lives in Winchester, Virginia. He's originally from Salinas, California. Um, he has a, a also 
a remarkable story. He uh, led some supply convoys during the Korean War, very dangerous ones in all weather. Uh, he later served with the Red Cross in Vietnam during the Vietnam War. And he's going to be our guest on BBC Happy Hour on uh, Monday night, September 4th, uh, with some of his comrades from Korea. We're going to focus on their stories. So let's give Nars a round of applause. We have Curtis D. Copeland Sr., uh, who died several years ago, and his son, uh, Curtis Copeland Jr., and his widow, Betty, are going to be receiving the certificate and pin in his honor. Um, he's another remarkable story. He uh, joined the Navy, was a pharmacist mate, third class. Then the Korean War broke out, and he had to take a cram course in triage. And he was assigned to the 1st Marine Division as a foreman during the Korean War. Gilbert Davis, he's watching online. Gilbert served in Korea. Rodney Dovich, you are here with us tonight. Uh, Rodney is here with his, his wife is from Korea. He served in the Army 19, in, in uh, Korea 1988 to 1989. Janet Driggers is here with us. First time I got to meet her tonight. She was served in the Air Force was in Korea May 2000 to May 2001. And I would encourage everybody to realize that every one of these veterans does have a story, uh, not only about their service experience, but also about their time in Korea. You don't have to ask too much to get the story, but you do have to ask because they won't offer it unless, unless you ask. L. John Grogan, John, are you here tonight? He must be watching at home. He's a retired Marine Corps major, uh, served in Korea. We will put that certificate in the mail to him. Uh, Colonel Dan Hansen, I know Colonel Dan is here, recently retired. He did 15 years serving in Korea. Uh, yeah. His final position in Korea was as U.S. Defense Attaché to the Republic of Korea at the U.S. Embassy. That's pretty impressive. Bob Harbula. There we go. Bob is also very proud of his son, Scott, who is a retired uh, Air Force major. He served in Somalia, Bosnia, and Korea. Oh, Patrick Hughes. Patrick Hughes is, an, is a Vietnam veteran, Army veteran who lives in Texas. He joins us every Monday night on BBC Happy Hour. Uh, he's been joining us for years. And it's so interesting that so many people join us every Monday night and I feel like I've met them. I feel I know them. And I do know them, but I've never met them in person. And Patrick is one of them. I know that he's watching tonight. Uh, Patrick, what I didn't know, because we talked a bit about his Vietnam service, I didn't know that he also served in Korea in 1973, 1974. He said he loved it. He loved it. But he said it was so poor. 50 years ago, South Korea was so poor, one of the poorest countries in the world. He said rice, when he was there, was rationed. Um, uh, there was a curfew every night, every night for everyone. And he said one of his joys of life has been living long enough to see South Korea thrive and have it be one of the most prosperous countries in the world. I don't know if any country in the world has changed more in the past 50 years in South Korea. And, uh, and, and I found it very moving what Patrick had to say uh, because he said the Korean people were wonderful. And, uh, and he was very grateful uh, that uh, to be able to live long enough to see the prosperity. So Patrick Hughes, we salute you. Leroy Jeffries uh, Jr. Uh, his daughter, Brenda, who lives in Ohio, uh, 
asked us to honor him. He just recent, recently passed away and he was a Korean War veteran who served during the Korean War. And we do want to honor him and we will send a pin and a certificate to Brenda, his daughter. Bert Kennedy, look at Bert Kennedy. He's here tonight, I saw him walk in. Bert is a very active defender of Korea, very active veteran, uh, officer in the uh, Korean War Veterans Association. He served with the Army in the 7th, attached to the 7th Division, 1959-1960, and get a load of what he did. He was, uh, his job was being on a team to float these weather balloons in Korea for artillery. And to get the balloon in the air, they had a gas generator, Bert will correct me, and then they, when you mix water with calcium hydroxide. hydroxide, it creates hydrogen and it blows up the balloon. And uh, that's what you did for uh, the art for army artillery. This demonstration every day we use the bottle. <laughs> he said, "Oh, so, that was a demonstration. Usually, they just got it out of a bottle." <laughs> I have this romantic idea of him going down to the creek every day and blowing up a balloon. And one of the great treasures that he has, that Bert has, is a collection of slides that he converted to prints. And they're beautiful. Talk about capturing like a moment in time. This is South Korea, 1960, when Bert was there. These are one of his many, many photos that gives you a sense of the, the villages uh, at the time. Larry Kennard. I know that he was a is was a national officer for the uh, the Korean War Veterans Association. He served in the Third Infantry Division. I also know he's joining us online. Uh, he served in the he's from Texas, lives in Texas. He served with the Third Infantry Division as a forward observer with I Company, Fifteenth Regiment. Uh, I also know Susan Key did a wonderful interview with Larry. I encourage you to watch it. You could find it online very easily uh, where he shares his story. Larry Kennard. John Kramer. John, are you here with us tonight? Oh, darn it. We'll have to put it in the mail because John has a, fat, he was U.S. Air Force, served in Korea, did a couple tours in Korea, and he had a very interesting job. I think it, would, it was interesting. He was in intelligence, and his job was to interpret Imagery, imagery taken from SR-71s, you know, uh, pictures taken from U-2 spy planes, and pictures also then from satellites of North Korean positions. And his job was to interpret the photographs and figure out what was in it and what should be done, if anything, to counter what was discovered. He said it was a fascinating job, and, uh, and he was, I'm sure, very good at it. Um, John Kramer, we salute you. Vicki Latella, Vicki, come on up. I met her tonight. Vicki is another Air Force veteran, served at Kunsan and Osan Air Base in Republic of Korea. First tour, 1995 to 1996. Second, 2000, 2001. Her father, who's deceased, was Natalene R. Latella Jr. He fought in the Korean War with the Army. And one of the first things I just asked Vicki when I met her is, what did your dad say about the war? And she said, nothing, yeah. ever, except she was able to get him on a, on a connection, on an audio connection. I guess it was a, during, the, uh, during the anniversary, the 50th anniversary in 2000, when she was in Korea. And she said, I was able to, I knew nothing about his service and I wanted to have him honored at you know, this 50th anniversary celebration in, in Korea. So I kind of forced him to you know, share a little bit and he talked for 45 minutes and it was everything I knew. It, it, everything he said was new to me. And that's what I know of his service. And it, I thought that was very touching, father and daughter serving together. Thank you, Vicki. Oh, man, Mortimer, I love Mortimer. Like, so he joins us on BBC Happy Hour from Canada. 
And he always keeps us Americans honest because he says, you know, you Americans weren't the only ones who fought in the Korean War. <laughs> he was in the Royal Canadian Air Force and he served in the Korean War. He served in Vietnam actually also. And uh, here he is getting a commendation. Uh, his job was flying, he was a crew member for many years flying in this airplane, the North Star, a Canadian, I think it was a Canadian DC-4. And their job was to keep the Allied line supplied in Korea, and they would also bring back wounded Canadian and American service members to the U.S. and to Canada. And he said that was a very poignant memory. Thank you, Mort, so much for joining us, and thank you for your service. We have Ed McDonald with us tonight, Edward McDonald. Ed, would you mind coming up, please? Ed, what branch of service did you serve in? Army Signal Corps. Army Signal Corps, and when did you serve in Korea? That's a good question. <laughs> you didn't know this was going to be a quiz. You were the telephone man. You were the telephone man in Korea. Nothing as dramatic as some of the other books here. Oh, gotta have a phone. Yeah. Gotta have a telephone. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> hey, those of you who have joined us online on Monday nights, you'll remember fondly Bud Mendenhall, who lives in Fort Wayne, Indiana. He joins us and uh, joined us to share his story. A wonderful Korean War veteran, high energy 90 year old who talked about serving on a, the USS Karmic, which was a minesweeper. Uh, and he served at the same time that Dwayne was an, in Wonsan Harbor. Wonsan Harbor on the Eastern side of North Korea became the most heavily mined place on earth. And <laughs> Bud Mendenhall served on a minesweeper in the largest, most densely packed minefield on earth. And their job, of course, was blowing up mines. It was a very dangerous pl place to land. Uh, Dwayne landed there. Bud, I hope you're well and enjoying the 70th uh, anniversary celebration. Bud Mendenhall. Leland Miller, I met you yesterday at our Veterans Breakfast Club event at Christ Church Grove Farm in Sewickley. Uh, Leland served in the Army during the Korean War, and his brother also, older brother, also served at the same time. Yes, the 45th Infantry Division, 45th Oklahoma Division, Infantry Division served in uh, Korea. I got an email from Michelle Lee Miller that she is sick today and wanted so badly to be here, but she can't make it tonight. So she is watching online. Uh, Michelle Lee, we're, uh, we're in your corner. Hope you feel well. She served in Kunsan Air, Air Base in Korea, August 2006 to August 2007. Recently retired from the Air Force. Thank you, Michelle. Look at this young man in his uniform, Dwayne Myers. This is, uh, I believe this might have been when you received your Purple Heart, but I'm not sure. Yeah, we would give you a certificate, but it's classified and we can't. We have Lieutenant Colonel Adam J. Points with us tonight. Last week, I saw him at our event at the Grist House in Millville, and I saw his name, and I said, man, this guy looks familiar, and his name sounds familiar, but I just can't quite place him. And he came up to me, and he said, I met you in Hanoi in 2020. 
And I said, oh my God, yes, that's it. That's it. That's where I met you. He was the commander of a uh, of the POW MIA accounting agency detachment in Hanoi doing very important work. And he's pictured here doing that work with his Vietnamese counterpart, uh, working hard to account for the MIA of uh, you know classifying remains, finding remains, identifying remains. That was a big part of his job and such an important job. He's recently retired. I'm telling your life story here. I mean, re recently retired and at least temporarily relocated to Pittsburgh. We hope he stays. Thank you, Colonel. Larry Popovich, he, uh, he signed up for this event as a uh, defender of Korea. Uh, I believe he's joining us online. If you're not in the room tonight, uh, we'll get you your pin and certificate in the mail. Tom Riley, originally from Beaver County. I understand he's relocated to Rhode Island. He's watching online tonight. Uh, also served in Korea as well as Vietnam. Richard J. Sager. Oh, yeah, let's round of applause. Richard J. Sager also signed uh, up and uh, will, is watching online and we will get his recognition to him in the mail. Look at this young man, Frank Santucci. Frank, what happened? Frank is a wonderful person and a wonderful writer who has worked very hard to write a lot of the stories that he that he has to share of growing up in Verona, uh, serving in the army, serving overseas in Korea. He served in the Pusan port as an ordnance parts specialist. He has shared a funny story at our Veterans Breakfast Club events about you know, Santucci, he's Italian, about his, uh, I think it was his good Italian mother who decided Frank needs a bottle of wine. And so she carved out bread put a bottle of wine in the bread, the bread, sent the bread overseas and it got there. Look at this is Frank as a kid wearing knickers. Oh, I love it. Here he is in an orphanage in Korea. And then this photo, I believe, Frank, did it appear in the Pittsburgh Press? The Pittsburgh Sun-Telegraph. This appeared, he sent this home, and the Pittsburgh Sun-Telegraph published it because here it is, like, a, this is a local Korean village, and you have Gimbals and Macy's and... <laughs> Love it. Just I, I learned so much from our veterans. Thank you, Frank. Joe Scantena. Served in Korea with the 2nd Infantry Division. Joe served in, in Korea 1966-1967, the Indian Head Division, the 2nd uh, Infantry Division. And then the Army saw fit to send him to Vietnam after that. Volunteered. You volunteered? Yeah. Uh, Terry Steele from uh, lives in Ohio, and uh, she wanted to honor her father, Adam I. Steele Jr. Uh, Adam was from Webster County, West Virginia, in the 45th Infantry Division. He was captured by the Chinese, and he suffered enormously as a POW, languishing in wretched POW camps, uh, and only liberated, of course, after the armistice. He had went through a long rehabilitation and remained in the army and retired with the army in the 101st, uh, 101st Airborne Division. So we want to honor Adam I. Steele Jr. Thomas R. Smith is here with his very large family. Uh, Tom is another one of these wonderful Korean War veterans who has taught me so much about the war and about those who fought in it. Um, uh, 
Tom was with the 25th Infantry Division. He arrived in 1951, and he saw a lot of combat. Thank you, Tom. He's also the proud father of three sons who served in the Army, two of whom are here tonight. Peter Sens, are you here? Oh, you! I thought that was you. Come on up, Peter. You weren't in Korea. <laughs> well, we get to look at a nice picture of Peter when he... Look what a young, nice young man he was. Um, he served as an MP. I thought you had served in Korea, Peter. No. That's the only place you didn't go. Okay. John Urso. John, you're here this evening, I believe. John, come on up. John was a radio, radio operator. And he was stationed during the Korean War, or after the Korean War, in, at Formosa, which is now Taiwan. And I didn't know this, but there were a lot of North Koreans on Formosa. They had been captured by the Allies. They had decided, these North Koreans, that they didn't want to go back to North Korea. And so for their own safety, they were taken to Formosa, where they were then, you know, patriated, repatriated elsewhere. Uh, I know it was a hard year that you spent in Formosa. Uh, two years in Formosa. Um, thank you very much, John. Another person with movie star looks is Carmen Vaca. His friend, Rick Erisman, here. Uh, we're going to have Rick. You're going to pick up Carmen's pin and certificate. Uh, Carmen is a, was an Army veteran, Korea. He has shared his story with the Heinz History Center. This is a man who served in Korea. He's an Italian immigrant, served in Korea as his family back home was being threatened with deportation. It was agonizing for him. He was going to be sent to the front lines. He shared his story at, his, at our breakfast. And he said, I feel like the only thing that saved me from you know some of the worst fighting in Korea was on the way, we landed at Pusan, I think it was, and we were driven in trucks, and I was going to be taken to the DMZ, and the truck broke down. <laughs> and he said, I was the only one who knew how to fix it. And that saved me. They made me a mechanic. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's worth it to volunteer. Rock's Vanguard served in Korea for 13 months, 1967, 1968. I know he's watching online. Rocks, thank you for your service. If you were at our Grist House event, uh, you heard Ben Bond speak. He's not with us here tonight, but we're going to put this in the mail to him. Ben is the United States Air Force. I love this story. Joined the Air Force because he needed some direction in life. They gave him a test. They figured he was very smart, and they put him in intelligence and had him learn Korean. And he was shipped to Korea to the DMZ, listening to North Korean radio traffic, radio communications, translating it by hand in a little notebook. Got out of the Air Force, did a career with the CIA. Ben Vaughn, what a story. <laughs> Jeff Witherall, he lives in Virginia. He's joining us online. Uh, Jeff is originally from this area, but he uh, served, had a long career, retired as lieutenant colonel in the Army. He joins us again almost every Monday night online. He did one year in Korea in 1976 with the 2nd Infantry Division. Here he is with the dog at the DMZ. <laughs> Our very own Ben Wright is here. Ben, he flew C-130s in the 1970s in and out of South Korea. I want to call up a, uh, a father-son team, a really remarkable couple people I just met a few moments ago. We have Ronald Reich, who served during the Korean War, arrived in May 1953, uh, two months before the armistice. Ronald Reich, you can see he still can wear his uh, original blouse from the Army. And his son, Chip, also served in Korea 
1987 to 1989, modeled in Chipotle. Ron Eason? Is Ron Eason here? Ron, did you serve in Korea? Okay. <laughs> okay, I got it. I got to know. Somebody wrote your name down on a piece of paper. <laughs> Um, then we're going to end with a, a wonderful Korean War veteran, John Yates, another movie star looks guy. Look at that. What a handsome devil you were. You are. Get this. John comes from a family. Ten siblings served in the military, World War II and Korea. Ten siblings. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine being a parent and having ten siblings in the military during wartime, World War II and the Korean War? John served on this aircraft carrier, the USS Tarawa, which served in, in during the Korean War in the Korean waters, and uh, John brought to one of our breakfasts this wonderful map of one year in the service, 1953 to 1954. This is a world cruise. Some people join the Navy to see the world. You really did it. You did it. John Yates. I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight to remember the Forgotten War with us and to honor those who served in Korea, you know, past and present. Uh, it's been, it's always educational. It's always inspirational for people like me who haven't served. Uh, and I hope if you're a veteran that uh, you feel a little bit better about your service because we've taken the time to listen and to share your stories. I do encourage you, if you haven't been to a Veterans Breakfast Club event before, uh, I encourage you to come to one of them. We have them uh, throughout the region, uh, mostly in the morning, but we're trying to add evening events increasingly. And then, of course, we're always available online every Monday night. You go to veteransbreakfastclub.org. You can join us there. And if you want a magazine, we'd love to send you a magazine. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Ann Matters. Thank you to everybody at the, uh, at, uh, the Heinz History Center for hosting this tonight. Good night to everybody.